In this video, we're going to have a look at how the VP Labs X-ray tube simulator works. I want to start by explaining a little bit about this simulator. Most of it's fairly obvious, but there are one or two things that I do want to point out. This unit here is labelled EHT, and EHT stands for electric high tension, meaning high voltage. Over here, the cathode is a filament which is heated by a current from this low voltage unit over here. Here is a window and the purpose of the window is to allow the x-rays to be emitted to do their job at imaging, whilst the rest of the tube is made of lead to absorb any stray x-rays. There is a vacuum inside the tube, uh, the air has been evacuated from it. And the final thing to point out are the cooling fins attached to the anode the first thing that we try to get the students to understand is what happens at the low voltage unit and the cathode. So we ask them to turn on the low voltage and notice the differences. And uh, the way they do that is go over to this uh, area here and they click the button. Now the mistake that occasionally they make is that they try and click the word on and nothing happens. So they need to click the button. So we'll see what happens when we do that. And you can see that uh, the first thing is that this changes to red. That's to try and indicate to the students that the filament there is glowing red hot. Uh, you can see the electrons being produced across the tube here, and you can see the x-rays being produced at the target. When they turn the low voltage back off again, they can see that that stops. One of the things we want to get them to understand is the necessity for this low voltage and to understand the term thermionic emission. So we send them to a couple of uh, websites which will give them some information about this and get them to understand that the purpose of the low voltage is to heat up this filament which gives enough heat energy to the uh, electrons at the surface of the filament to escape and to form a cloud around the cathode. Now if this high tension unit here, this high voltage unit here was turned off then all that would happen is a cloud of electrons would form around the cathode and basically they'd have nowhere to go. It's only because this high tension unit, this high voltage unit, is turned on that we can get the electrons to be attracted across. So if we turn that back on again and see, what's happening is that the voltage here creates a negative at the cathode and a positive at the anode the negative repelling the electrons, the anode positive attracting the electrons, and the electrons will accelerate across this gap until they strike the target. The next thing that we want to look at is the effect of the high voltage unit here. So what we ask the students to do is to take this uh, unit and change the voltage as low as possible, and at the moment it's 10 kilovolts. So you drag hold of the knob here, click and drag and move it down to 10. And then we ask them to change the voltage to 20, 30, 40, 50 and 60, although they don't have to be accurate on this. So as we grab and change, let's have a look at what happens at 20, 30, 40, 50 and 60. Whilst this is uh, quite clear on the actual simulation, unfortunately you might not be able to notice these changes on this particular video. What we would want the students to notice is that as the voltage increases, the speed of the electrons across the tube increases and the intensity of the x-rays increases as well. Another thing to point out uh, at this point that the students would uh, uh, need to know is that the voltage here is measured in kilovolts. So obviously when it says 10, that's 10 kilovolts and 60 would be 60 kilovolts. And it's important that the students are aware that it's not 10 volts and 60 volts. If you've read the student instruction sheet, you'll also notice that we try to get them to see that the x-rays are emitted in a whole variety of directions and only those going in the direction towards this window can escape and then be targeted at the, uh, the person or whatever is being x-rayed. 
The rest of the x-rays uh, get absorbed by the shield, which is the hole of the tube is shielded, and we want them to notice that because, of course, the safety elements of using an x-ray tube are important to, for them to notice as well. For the next part, we want them to see the x-rays as waves rather than the kind of rays that they appear as on now. So the way we do that is we move down to the bottom here and they have to click on the button to change it from showing rays to waves. So by doing that, you can see now that the waves are being demonstrated here. Now we've already asked the students, if you look at the instruction sheet, you'll see that we've asked them to make sure that the voltage here is at 10. And what we ask them to do is to slowly but surely change the voltage from 10 around to 60. And of course, what we're trying to do here is get them to realize that the wavelength of the x-rays produced as this voltage increases, the wavelength decreases. Up until this point, it's possible for the students to think that for any particular high voltage across the anode cathode, that only one wavelength of x-rays is emitted, or even one type of x-ray is emitted at any particular voltage. But in fact, that's not so, and we now need to take them a step further for them to understand exactly what's going on. So we do that by going down to this left corner here, and we click on Show Spectrum. And as you can see, instead of just one wavelength of x-rays being produced at this voltage, in fact there is a spectrum of wavelengths being produced. And the students can see what happens to that spectrum as we change the voltage. So let's do that now. So as we move the voltage up, you can see the wavelengths changing and the spectrum changing until we get to that point where suddenly a spike appears. And if we go a bit further, you can see too. Now, I'll explain in a moment what that's all about. But as you can see, as we increase the voltage, this happens. So let's first try and explain the spectrum. And we'll talk about the spikes in the spectrum in a moment. The thing to notice then is that there is a, a minimum wavelength in this spectrum of x-rays and then the spectrum obviously increases and as we change the voltage you can see what's happening to that minimum. The minimum wavelength is getting shorter. So how do we explain this? Well, the electrons are going to be accelerated across the gap until they hit the tungsten target. And when they do hit the target, they're going to be slowed down and stopped. There is a German word to describe this and it is as follows. I can't pronounce it, so I'm going to get something to pronounce it for me. The German word is... Bremsstrahlung. I'll do that again. Bremsstrahlung. And that word means breaking radiation. Here the term breaking means slowing. So this means the x-rays produced by the slowing of the electrons as they hit the tungsten target. So basically what's happening is these electrons are going to come across here with a, an amount of energy and they're going to hit the target and as they enter the target they're going to start to be slowed down. Now as they are slowed down their kinetic energy will be changed into other forms. Now one of those forms will be x-rays. Now depending on the amount of energy that's given up into x-rays will be dependent on the wavelength produced. Now, of course, there is a minimum of amount of energy that's required to emit x-rays, and therefore that's what's happening here. If the voltage isn't high enough, then there won't be any x-rays produced. But as the voltage increases, then more of that energy that's given to the electrons can be then re-emitted as uh, x-ray energy with a variety of wavelengths depending on any particular electron slowing down at a particular rate and that might vary from its neighbour. So a whole spectrum of x-rays is emitted and that's what you're seeing here. But there is a minimum that's required to produce x-rays. Now whilst all this information is not needed 
for your students to know, it is important for them to be aware of that a great deal of the kinetic energy that these electrons have when they hit the target is not changed into uh, X-ray energy, but is in fact changed into heat. Hence the need for the cooling fins around this area here to take away that heat because somewhere in the order of 99% of the kinetic energy is changed to heat and only about 1% is changed into X-rays. So let's concentrate on the electrons then that are going to give their energy in the form of X-rays. As they come in, uh, they will have accelerated, gained a certain amount of kinetic energy, and they will then hit the target. Now, any one electron might interact with one atom of tungsten and may give up all of its energy in that interaction. But on the other hand, it may not. It may, in fact, interact slightly with one uh, atom of tungsten, and it may then move on and interact with several more, giving up energy at various stages. So depending on the energy that's given up at each interaction will depend on the X-rays that are produced. Hence the spectrum that you see here. So now let's consider what happens as we increase that voltage. Well, as you can see, we get to a point where we get these spikes. Now, what are they? Well, they are what we call characteristic X-rays, and they depend on the target material. Because what's happening at this point, then, is that we've now given enough energy to the incoming electrons so that instead of just giving up X-ray energy as they slow down, they actually now interact with the electrons of the tungsten. And they can then give their energy to that uh, electron of the tungsten, and that can then move up an energy level within the tungsten itself. And then as the electron of the tungsten atom falls back down to its original level, it emits energy in the X-ray wavelength. And as the um, amount of energy emitted, and therefore the wavelength of the X-ray emitted, depends on the target material, the tungsten target material in this case, the spikes are at very specific energy points. So as we increase the voltage, you'll see that those spikes remain at the same wavelength position because what you're getting is simply the LA energy from the X-rays being emitted as the electrons from the tungsten fall back from one energy level to another. Now another thing now that we get the students to do is click on this button here that says show theory. And when you do click on that button, a new window opens. And this is the window that appears. It does give them more information than they actually need to know, but they'll be able to pick up from here the size of the wavelength of X-rays being in the order of 0.1 nanometers. And the fact that this particular size is so important that it's actually given a name, the name being angstrom. Something else that they should be able to see from the information in this window is the link between the energies. And of course the energy of the incoming electron will be given by a half mv squared. And the maximum energy of the x-ray will be given by hc over lambda. So assuming that all of the energy from the incoming electron was equal to the energy of the uh, x-ray, then a half mv squared would equal hc over lambda. And the clever student should be able to spot, therefore, that the greater the energy of the incoming electron, the shorter will be the wavelength of the x-ray produced. So that concludes the work that we do with this particular simulation. Hopefully you've seen enough to be able to help the pupils use it and get the most out of it. And uh, hopefully they will be able to use it too.